ahead and turn with me this morning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Last week we looked at a section of scripture in the Old Testament where the Lord comes to a guy with a funny name named Zerubbabel who was trying to build the temple and it had stalled and he said, you're going to build the temple, Don't who has despised the day of small beginnings. And we correlated that to this little group of people here and not only our church but our lives We all have different areas of small beginnings. And today this is somewhat in line with what we looked at last week. The title of this sermon is called The Family Business. I know we've got a couple of family businesses here today with us. We're going to look at Luke chapter 2 starting in verse 40. I'm sure most of us know this story. This is speaking of Jesus and it says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem, according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company... They went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, boy, I tell you what, you have that happens nowadays. Child protective services be getting called on you. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. I would imagine they're probably slightly frantic. I know I would be. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple. Can you imagine that? Three days they're looking for Jesus. One time justice decided to take off in the middle of Walmart and she was in one aisle one second and the next second she was gone and we're frantically searching searching Walmart and all of a sudden we get a hear a call of the intercom, intercom family buyers please come come to the front of customer service and there's a little three and a half year old justice sitting there luckily she knew what her last name was and that was only about three minutes I can't imagine three days so when they did not find him they returned to Jerusalem seeking him Now, so it was that after three days, I think that's interesting, three days, think about next week and what we celebrate, three days, Jesus is is risen. They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them, listen to this, asking them questions, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Can you imagine that? He's sitting amongst some of the most learned men of his day, the Pharisees, it was said, would memorize the entire scripture. And these guys are astonished at what Jesus is saying, a 12-year-old boy. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? That's probably about what I'd be saying, maybe a little more forcefully. Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Jesus always has the right answer. He said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And that train of thought followed Jesus the rest of his life. He would make statements that would leave people scratching their heads. And 2,000 years later, we're here, we can ponder these statements and glean some wonderful truths. And I love what he says there. Did you not know that I must... I must be about my father's business. A lot of times you don't see that anymore these days. Maybe in rural Montana it's more common, but in most of society today, family businesses aren't real popular. Partnerships aren't real popular. And a lot of times if you do have a family business, they end up dissolving because of infighting and all sorts of different things and people can't get along. But one of our main focuses in life as Christians, as believers, should be to be a part of our family business, be about the father's business. It should be something that we give foremost priority to, building not our own kingdoms, not our own businesses, but the kingdom of God. We need to find out what that business is. It's, it's, as I've said often lately, when looking at these types of things, it's, it's real easy to throw around these buzzwords like building the kingdom or the father's business, but what does that actually mean? I think one of the things we can start off this morning at looking at is God is in the business of changing lives, and he's called us to do the same thing. I believe one of the main things that we start 
by doing to build his kingdom and to be about his business is starting with us, starting in our homes. It's kind of like Jesus said, before you remove the little speck, the little piece of dust in your brother's eye, take care of the huge problem in your own life. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to start building the kingdom and being about the Father's business in us, in our own prayer lives, in our own devotional time, in our own lives, and in our homes. God needs to take most, first and foremost priority. Go ahead and quickly turn with me to John chapter 6. Just read a short section here. I'm going to start off with the very basic thing that we need to do to be about our father's business. How many of you know if you have a father, that means you're what? You're a son, you're a daughter, you're a child. But if, you don't, if he's not your father, you're not an heir, you're not a child. So we need to start at, at basic rule number one in John ch chapter 6, starting in verse 25. And they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Listen to what he says here. Do not work, talking about the family business, do not work for the food that perishes. So often, that's what we do. We're consumed with this life and the things of this life, which is going to perish eventually. A hundred years from now, much, much, if not 95% of what we're doing today and this week won't matter. But work for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? If we want to know what the family business is, that's kind of an important question. Lord, what must we be doing to be doing your work? And Jesus answered them and said, here, you want to know what the first step is? Here's the first step to be about the Father's business. This is the work of God, that you believe in him who sent me. That's step number one, to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And last night before I went to bed, I happened to, I'm kind of a YouTube nut. I don't mind admitting that. I like YouTube. There's a lot of cool things on YouTube. And I don't even remember what I was looking at. Usually it's something to do with elk hunting or bow hunting or some type of hunting. But I don't remember. Somehow something popped up, and I, I think YouTube has one of those things where it kind of remembers what you like. And I've looked at sermons and stuff, and this thing popped up where it's a, it's a, a guy that runs this YouTube channel. He's an Israeli, and he's not a Christian or anything, but people from America and all around the world will send him questions about, he'll go and say, why... Why do you treat the Palestinians this way? Or he'll go to the Palestinians and say, why do you, just random people on the street, why do you, why do you hate Israel so much? Just these crazy, kind of difficult questions. And one of the questions someone sent him is, what, what, who is Jesus to, to the Israelis, to the Jews? And it was, it was heartrending, every person he asked. Oh, he was a prophet. One guy said, may he rest in peace. He was a good man. Not one of them said he was the son of God. Not one. Most of them said, oh, that's the Christian God, just like Muhammad is and Allah are the, the Islamic prophet and, and Allah is their God. That's key here. He said, to do my work, to do the work of God. How many of you know these Jews? Matter of fact, he had, you know the, the, the Hasidic Jews with the, the curls down the side and the hat. He asked one of them, the guy, the guy couldn't really answer. He couldn't even barely answer to what his own beliefs were. Here he is, all pious and kind of like the Pharisees, walks around and I've seen these, I've been to Israel when I was a kid, and when you're on the airplane, I mean, 6, 6 a.m. in the morning, those guys are all up there with their little prayer shawls, and they're religious, and, and they follow the law to the letter. But when this, this question was posed to this Hasidic Jew, the guy couldn't even answer. He could barely even correlate the two. Not much has changed. Jesus said, the first step is you have to believe in him who sent me, and you have to believe in me, that I'm the Son of God. This is a transition to John Later in John chapter 6, verse 30, it says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus' whole life in ministry was the summary of one thing. One thing. Doing the will of his Father. Not building his own kingdom, building the kingdom of God on this earth. It's one of the things that sets Christianity apart. You look at Buddha, 
Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam. Men trying to build their own reputation, their own way, their own kingdom. Jesus says, I'm not here to build my kingdom. Matter of fact, how many of you know most of the Jews were looking for a king that was going to deliver them from what? The oppression of Rome. Matter of fact, Judas, the Iscariot, was a zealot. And one of the reasons he was upset with Jesus was because he was looking for this guy that was going to come and break the shackles of Rome. Jesus says, no, 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 you don't understand. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm not building my own reputation. What does the Bible say? He made himself of what? No reputation. That's a complete opposition to every other religion you see. Everybody else is looking in all these different religions to build their own, their own reputation, to build their own little kingdom, to make a name for themselves. Jesus says, I'm not looking to make a name for myself. In fact, it's the exact opposite. I'm going to go die on a cross. That's a big difference from most of the religions you see nowadays, and that's one of the things that sets Christianity apart. Now, once we've believed in Christ, we don't just stop there. Once we're born again, it's kind of like Samuel. He's about ready to turn two. As of two years ago almost, he was just a little baby. He was born, but now... Samuel's starting to have say a couple words here and there. And grace is finally potty trained. And justice is finally in preschool and getting ready to go to school this year. There's incremental growth between all three of my kids. And, and as Christians, it's the exact same thing. The Lord doesn't want us to just believe on him. He wants us to believe on him and then what? Start to mature. Start to be, like the Bible says, conformed to the image of Christ. As we, be conform, as we become conformed to his image... We go from being babies to maturing sons and daughters. And now we need to do what? Be about the Father's business and start building the kingdom of God. Not only in us and in our lives, but in the world around us. How I many of you know 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 11? It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, what did he do? He put away childish things. That's the intention of God for all Christians. Not to understand as a child and speak as a child. Not to constantly have to have your diaper changed. I've seen that my whole life in, in Christian circles that people have been saved 20, 30 years and it's like they're no different than the day they got saved. That's not God's intention. He says, listen, yes, when you're a child, you're going to do childish things. But as you mature, which I expect you to do, Eventually, you need to get to the point where you're a mature son and you're a mature daughter, and you're going to put away these little childish things. And that's being conformed to the image of Christ. So first, we believe in him who sent, who sent him, and we believe in him, the son. Then we need to learn to mature, which transitions in not, to not only building the Father's kingdom and, his, and doing his business and his work in our own lives and our own homes, but that transitions into something bigger. This is part. You ever heard of the definition of maturity that says, producing more than you consume. Right now, all my kids do is consume. They consume my food. Samuel consumes a lot of diapers. They consume everything. Seems like all we ever do is, is feed them and, and wipe butts, to be blunt. They're, consuming, they're consumers, and that's okay because that's the age and the stage of life they're in. But when they get to be 15, I don't expect them to just consume all the time. They're going to start to make a transition to chores, and producing some stuff, and at some point in their life, they're going to get pushed out of the nest, and they're going to produce a whole lot more than they consume. That's maturity, and that's maturity in the Christian as a Christian, Produ producing more than you're consuming. That when God pours into our vessels, what do we need to do? Start pouring into other vessels. And the first thing we want to look at today is in Romans chapter one. It's amazing. Paul says that he has he's a that, that he is a debtor. Not only is, our, is it our responsibility, we owe a debt as Christians. How many of you know that? Now, we owed a debt we couldn't pay, which Jesus came as a sacrifice for our sins and paid for us. But we also owe another debt that you don't hear a lot about. And in Romans 1, chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 14, it says, this is Paul speaking, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, to Gentiles both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me I am ready, what is his debt? To preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul is saying, I owe a debt. 
It is my responsibility. I owe a debt to the world to preach the gospel. It's my responsibility. It's my duty. It's the same thing with us. We're no different. We have a responsibility as Christians to proclaim the good news. And I want to bring your attention very quickly this morning to something that Jesus constantly said. We're talking about building his kingdom, right? When you see in scripture where Jesus says the gospel, what does he say? Does he say the gospel of how to get saved? Is that what it says? I came to you to preach the gospel of how to get saved. No, he says, I came to you preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom, the kingdom of God. Now, getting saved, becoming born again, and believing in him who sent Jesus, believing in the Son himself is the first step. But there's much more than that. We are to build the kingdom. It is the gospel of the kingdom. It is not the only step. How many of you know what the word gospel means? The good news. We are to proclaim. We are. We owe a debt. We owe a debt to proclaim the good news of Christ to a lost and dying world. It's also our duty. And in Ezekiel 33, this is an amazing passage of Scripture. The Lord comes to Ezekiel, the prophet, starting in verse 7. He says, So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die. Listen to what he says to Ezekiel. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But listen to this. His blood I will require at your hands. The wicked man will die for his wickedness. But guess what's going to happen? If you don't do what I told you to do, if you don't warn him, if you don't pay your debt, I'm going to require his blood at your hands. Nevertheless, if you do warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. We have an incredible responsibility to make sure that we are proclaiming the good news to the people in our lives that don't know the good news. It is our debt. And I, for one, do not want to stand before the Lord in Judgment Day and have a friend of mine or a neighbor of mine or a family member of mine standing before the Lord getting ready to get thrown into the lake of fire and have them turn to me and say, why didn't you ever say a word to me? Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you show me the way? Now, it's like he says to Ezekiel, maybe they won't turn, but it is our responsibility regardless to try to show them the way. And God help us all because I know for me, there's a lot of people in my life that I owe the debt to that I haven't started paying that debt yet. I haven't started proclaiming the good news. We need to ask the Lord to give us boldness and courage to proclaim the good news. It is a responsibility as believers to preach the gospel and to build the kingdom of God. Now, talking about the Father's business. We're all called to proclaim the good news. Some have a gifting of that more than others. We need to find out what our calling is by God. Ephesians 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? To do our own thing? No, for good works. People say, well, you know, works is, is not important. Some people take the other side of the extreme. The Catholic Church say it's all based on works, which is not right. But you can't separate the truth. Faith without works is what? Dead. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We should walk in them. We should be about the Father's business. Ephesians 4.1 says, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Think on that. Walk in the manner which, which, worthy of the manner in which you've been called. Is that you? Does that apply to us? Does that describe our lives? Are we walking worthy in the manner with, with which we were called? Now, clearly, we're not all called to full-time ministry. Not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody's called to go over to Africa or Russia or the uttermost parts of the earth and be missionaries. We're not all called to go. Some are called to stay. Many are called to stay. However, we are called to spread God's love and shine his light into the hearts of those around us, whatever way possible. That's building the kingdom of God. That's being about the Father's business, even including other Christians. Building the kingdom doesn't just apply to the, un to the unsaved. It, it does in large part, but not just the unsaved. It applies to building each other up, like we talked about recently, the unity of the faith. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9 says, listen to this, for we are laborers. We are laborers together with who? 
God. Some people say, well, I, in, in preparation for the sermon, I was doing some studies, and, so, and, and someone brought up the point. One guy, I get so sick of hearing this phrase to build the kingdom of God. God God's going to build his kingdom regardless, and you know that, that, that's putting all the, 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 the responsibility on us, and, and, and we're going to take credit for it. Basically, is kind of what he was saying. That, that to say that we need to build the kingdom of God is basically to say that it's, it's, it's not going to happen without us. Well, I don't agree with what he's saying because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are laborers together with God. God does his work through what? Human hands through us. Starting in the Old Testament all the way through to, to the end. He's always done his work through vessels, human vessels, imperfect vessels. We need to keep asking ourselves, what business? What is this father's business? What is the business that we're supposed to be a part of? If I asked Brother Nick here or Brother Bob, what is your family business? It's pretty pretty easy answer. We farm. Right? If I ask TJ, TJ, what's your family business? It's farming and ranching. I have families, members that are in business, and their business is construction, remodeling. Pretty, it's a pretty easy answer. Well, the th same thing should be for us. And every business, most businesses, have business goals. They have think places they want to get to. We want to get from A to B, and we need to figure out how. What are our business goals? You know, you hear that a lot these days. Well. What are Christ's business goals? What is the Father's business goals? Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. Christ, Christ lays it out for us. He doesn't make us wonder. He makes it very clear. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Christ's business goals. That's his goals for us. We're all called to be kings and priests unto our God. And he has sent us to preach the gospel, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to those who are in oppression and captives, to give sight to people who are spiritually blind, and to set at liberty those who are spiritually oppressed. That's the Father's business. That's what he has called us to do. And what did I say earlier? If we want to be conformed to his image, if we want to go from being babes to mature sons, we need to be conformed to his image and emulate what he said he came to do. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. Listen to this. Always, always abounding. Abounding, not partially not dipping your toe in, <clears throat> abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that, the, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It's really easy as Christians, I just preached on this, I think it was last week, to get discouraged at times. Sometimes you feel like the labor that you're doing is completely in vain. It's like, Lord, I, I don't know why I'm doing this. It doesn't seem to be having any impact. It doesn't seem to be doing anything good. But he says, no, your labor isn't in vain. And like I said last week, what are our motives? Who are we trying to please? Another New Living Translation says it this way, So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. I like the way that says that. Work enthusiastically. You know, I know for myself, a lot of days I show up to work and it's like, the, the, the most commonly used phrase in my workplace is, Hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm here. I say that myself. I heard it last night when I left and the midnight guy showed up. Hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm here. That's not what the Lord's called us to do as Christians. We shouldn't just be here. We shouldn't just be in church. We shouldn't just be doing the work because we're just doing the work. We should work enthusiastically. We should be excited about the work of the Lord. The business of God, listen to this, the business of God should concern us. The things of the kingdom, the things of God should concern us. I don't know about all of you, but for me personally, when I'm out and about and I have conversations with people, I, I, it's like I have little antennas up. And the moment I hear someone start talking about spiritual things, it's like, boom, it concerns me. I want to get involved in that conversation. I want to start getting down to the brass tacks of things. Oftentimes, I have antennas and all of a sudden, boom, it's like, I think this person's a Christian. Start talking to them. Hey, you're a Christian, aren't you? 
You're a brother, aren't you? Yep. Hey, I knew it. His, his spirit bore witness with your spirit that we're both sons of God. That's concerning, being concerned about the things of God. And oftentimes in my life, there's been things that have been important to me, naturally speaking, and I've had to put them on hold because something more important came up, which was the business of God. We should be willing to put aside our preferences, our plans, our priorities, so to speak. If something comes up concerning the Father's business, what should take first precedent? Our natural life work? No, the things of God. That should always take precedent. I can't tell you how many times Ashley has sat there having her warm meal, rewarm meals, or kind of, oh, man, my kids are going crazy, and he's over there talking. But she's, she has realized that for me, personally, there's one thing that comes more important than any, anything else in my life, and that's the business of the Father. I don't always hold true to that, but I try to make an effort, and we all should be in that, that mindset that whenever something arises that involves the bit father, business of the Father, building his kingdom, that nothing else really matters at that point. When a lost person or a brother, a fellow Christian who is discouraged comes to you, nothing else matters. The fact that I had a dentist appointment, I can reschedule that. Because in 100 years from now, what I'm doing regarding this life isn't going to matter as much as my spiritual and eternal reward and inheritance in that person's life. Now, just as I said, we're not all called to be full-time ministers. We're not all called to be Hudson Taylors to, the, to China and go into the villages of Africa. Some are. We, but here's the thing. We all have different gifts. We all have different callings. God's called us each to be different and do different things. Romans 12, verse 4 and 8, it says, For, G, for just as each of us have, has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Listen to what he says here. We all have different gifts. According to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Now, I'm, this is totally off topic, but I'm gonna, I, I, can't, I can't overlook this. We have a lot of people in the faith nowadays that think prophecy has been done and away with. When that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. The problem with that interpretation of Scripture is that which is in part was not the Bible. That which is in part, that which is perfect has come, is speaking of the second coming of Christ. Because it says where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will vanish away. Where it says there, where there is knowledge, it will cease. Is knowledge cease? Absolutely not. It says, for now we know in a glass darkly, we see as in a glass darkly, but then we shall see what? Face to page? No. Face to face. That which is perfect, that will come, was not the finishing of the Bible. It is the coming of Christ. He's the perfect one, and it says face to face. And actually, there's a section of Scripture, I can't think of the reference off the top of my head, it says, do not forbid to prophesy. In Revelation, it says, the spirit, the testimony of Jesus, anybody know the rest of it? What is the testimony of Jesus? The spirit of prophecy. But yet... Three quarters of the body of Christ now says that's not even available to us. Well, they need to read Revelations where it says that's the testimony of Jesus. So anyway, I, I had to stop and make that delineation. I believe that it's available. I believe that it's abused very often by those who do believe it's still available. I'm not, I'm not promoting a lot of what you see on TV, i.e. the 700 Club. But there is an availability of prophecy. And it's not always a foretelling of future events. It can be an encouragement or a word from the Lord. The Lord didn't just stop speaking. I don't believe that. I believe the Lord still speaks to us and can still work through us in the availability of prophecies, the encouragements. So he says, if your gift is prophecy, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. He does not say, oh, and by the way, it'll cease once the Bible's written. Going on, it says, if it is serving, then serve. Let's say we're all called to that gift. If it is teaching, then teach. Not everybody's called to be a teacher, but some are. If it is to, I like this one, if it is to encourage, then guess what? Give encouragement. If that's your calling, seek out those who need encouragement. And let's face it, a lot of us do. I know I myself do. And there's nothing more wonderful than when I am in a downcast or downtrodden position and another brother comes alongside, so to speak, puts his arm and says, hey, brother, I feel you. I'm praying for you. 
I understand what's going on. Some people have a gift of encouragement. It's like you just you, you talk to them and you just walk away feeling refreshed. If it is giving, then give generously. I knew of a man in one of our previous churches that the Lord had blessed his business extremely well financially, and he was he had the gift of giving. He was a wonderful giver. He gave cheerfully. He really ministered to the Lord through his giving. That was his gift. Not everybody is called to that, but that was his calling, so he fulfilled it. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 12, if you look up that passage of Scripture, reiterates that exact train of thought about we all have different giftings, we all have different callings, and we need to be faithful to that. I knew a guy years ago, he was a single guy, I believe at the time, or he might have been married or just married, no kids, didn't have a lot of money, didn't have, you know, didn't have the ability to give generously, but he had the gift of helps. When people were working on projects around their home and they were really under the gun and they, they were getting mired down in the mud, so to speak, man, this guy, I can't, I, I can't tell you how, how awesome it was to see him go and just come alongside his fellow brothers because he had time, he had abilities, construction abilities and painting abilities and all this stuff, and he would just help these people and, and, and relieve a tremendous burden. That was his gifting at the time. And that's what he was faithful to do. And that's what we should, that, that's being about the Father's business. That's building the kingdom. It is our responsibility to find out what the Lord has called us to do. We know the basics, believe in him, preach his gospel when we have a chance. But what is your specific calling? What is the specific gifting the Lord has given you? You need to find out what it is and then set about to do it. So often we try to, we make this big deal about, I don't know what my calling is. I don't know what my gifting is. You know what the Bible says? A man's gift makes room for him. When I first started out doing this, I was very unsure of whether I was supposed to be doing this. I've never felt called to the ministry. I don't really want to be in the ministry. I'm not the kind of guy that just gets excited about, you know, standing up and preaching in front of people. And I really don't get excited about trying to prepare a message every week. But someone that I respect highly came to me and said, you know what, I was... I was sharing with them my concerns about this whole this whole venture that we've started in the church. And he says, Justin, a man's gift will make room for him. The Lord's given you a gift. It's making room for you. It's your calling. And it was like, <laughs> the light bulb went on. I was like, okay, <laughs> here I am, Lord. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. I guess I never really thought of it that way, but it's true. And there are a lot of people, maybe your gift is evangelism. Maybe your gift is encouragement. Maybe your gift... Is, is music. Whatever your gifting is, whatever your calling is, it is your responsibility, not my responsibility, not your family members or your spouse's responsibility. It is your responsibility to figure out what it is, to get before the Lord and seriously seek Him. Say, Lord, what is your calling on my life? What do you want me to do? However small, however great, get before the Lord, find out what it is, and then just do it. We aren't to be what? Hearers only. We need to hear. It is our responsibility to open up our ears and find out what the Lord wants. But then, it doesn't stop there. We need to put our feet into walking motion and our hands into driving motion and do what he says. It's to be obedient. Because he will build his kingdom. I agree with that person that says that the Lord's going to build his kingdom regardless. He is. He will build his kingdom. He said, I will build my kingdom. I will what? Build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But, but... He has chosen to do it through who? Us. It is still of God and of his ways to use us to do these things. Now, quickly I want to look at a couple of hindrances. It's real easy to get all excited. Yep, we're going to build the kingdom of God. We're going to be about the Father's business. Woo! We're ready to roll. Well, there's some hindrances there, and I think we can all identify with this. Romans 7, 21. Paul says, one of the greatest builders of the kingdom, one of the greatest examples of being about the father's business says i find then a law a law that when i do would do good when i would be about the father's business listen to this evil is always present with me the moment you start to want to be about the father's business and set your face like a flint to do the things of god to be obedient to the calling that he's called you to do guess what happens there's another force. I mean, if you watch Star Wars, may the force be with you. They had the light force, the dark force. 
When you set your mind to do the things of God, guess what happens? The dark forces, the enemy, the spiritual rulers of wickedness in high places say, you know what? No, 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 no. We, we don't want that. We're going to stand against you. I mean, even remember the story of Daniel. The angel comes to him and says, the, the, the enemy, Satan, stood against me, but you were standing in the gap. You were praying. The moment you try to do what I'm saying today, the enemy is going to seek to hinder you, to discourage you, and here's a big one, distract you. He likes to distract us. It's very easy. I'm, I'm easily distracted by things. I'll set out to do one thing, and that t- next thing you know, I'm doing another. This week I was working on our house and all the remodeling stuff we're doing, and there's literally an endless list of things I need to do, a litany of things I need to get done, and I'm running into the garage doing this, and all of a sudden, oh yeah, I got to do this, and I'm, I'm running over, and I go to the house, and she goes, wait a second, weren't you just working on, you know, the trim over there? I'm like, yeah, but I, you know, I was easily distracted. Well, the, the Satan likes to do that to us. The moment we set about to do the Father's business, think of Jesus himself. <coughs> what was one of the first things that happened after Jesus started his ministry? Does anybody know? Satan came to him and tempted him. Ha-ha. Oh, the Savior's arrived, the Messiah. Let's see if we can distract him and deviate him from his course. Christ himself had Satan come against him, and it's no different with us. It's kind of like, anybody ever heard Newton's third law of physics? I'm going to put it to you the way it's formally stated. For every action... Guess what? There is an equal and an opposite reaction. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For every time you decide, Lord, I'm going to be obedient, I'm going to do what you've called me to do, and I'm going to be about your business, I'm going to build your kingdom in my life and in those around me, guess what? There's going to be an equal and an opposite reaction. Now, I guess I could say it's probably not going to be an equal, though, because how many of you know the verse that says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world? It's not an equal reaction, but there is going to be an opposite reaction. The enemy is going to come against you and say, no, no, we're going to stop this. Satan does not concern himself with complacent, non-working Christians. They are not a threat to him. Those who decide to be obedient, to build the kingdom, to be about their father's business, those people, they are a threat. And those are the ones he's going to target. He's going to try to hinder you. I want to make something very clear. Whenever you are building the kingdom of God, you know what that means oppositely? It's an automatic opposite reaction. It means you are tearing down the kingdom of Satan. If you are building the kingdom of God, think about Jesus. Wherever he went, he healed people, he delivered demon-oppressed people, He spoke liberty to the captives. What does that mean? The person that's holding them captive no longer has a captive. Whenever you build the kingdom of God in whatever capacity, it is an automatic guarantee. That means, by default, you are tearing down the kingdom of Satan. Now, that's an exciting thing. That's something I want to do. It's something we should all want to do. But, how many of you know, like I said, Satan is not going to just stand by and not do anything about that. He's going to seek to hinder you. Matthew 9, verse 35 and 38, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching what? Not the gospel of how to get saved, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, how many of you remember this passage we looked at? Well, not the specific one, but he was what? Moved with compassion, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd, It's amazing what he says next. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but there's a hindrance. Remember what I said. What does God do? He works through human hands. The harvest is plentiful, but we have a problem, guys. There's not very many laborers. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. All of this Matthew 9 involves stories of Jesus healing and delivering and building God's kingdom. I'm sure you can all relate. There's probably nothing more frustrating than come harvest time. You have a giant hundreds and maybe thousands of acres ready to harvest. And tractors aren't working. You don't have enough guys. 
Can you imagine sitting there come August and September having this lush, ripe field, and there's literally not a thing you can do to get it in your barns? That's kind of the way it is right now in the Christian faith. The harvest is plenty. There's plenty of people out there that we need to go and preach the good news to, the gospel of the kingdom. The problem is there's not a lot of laborers. God help us that we would become laborers. So those are some of the hindrances, some of the main hindrances. Very quickly, I want to look at some of the benefits, some of the benefits of building God's kingdom. Luke 2, verse 40, it says, we read this already, And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of of God was upon him. Do you want to grow? Do you want to become strong? Do you want to be filled with wisdom? Do you want the favor of God to be on your life? Well, guess what? You need to be the one who says, hey, I must, I must be about my father's business. Romans 8, 10 and 13 says, listen to this, the word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that's a very, very important step. You have to confess him. You have to believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Listen to this. You will be saved. That's an awesome section of scripture. You want to know how to make it? Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever, here's one of the benefits, whoever believes in the Lord, on him, guess what? They will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the Lord, same Lord is Lord over all. And here's another benefit. He is rich. What have I said recently? The Lord, the Lord is an abundant God. He's a God of plenty. He is rich to all. All, everyone, all is in everyone, all is in nobody left out. He is rich to everyone who chooses to call on him. For whoever calls in the name of the Lord, guess what's going to happen? They're going to be saved. I'd say the biggest benefit of building God's kingdom and being about your father's business is that you're going to make it into his kingdom. You're not going to be put to shame in the day of judgment. When you stand before God, he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy the rest. Enter into my joy and into my rest. And as we mature, another benefit is what? His word's going to be in our mouth. We won't be put to shame. He is rich in blessing. Think of those beatitudes. Blessed are those who. Blessed are those who, who are about my business, who are doing my work, who are obedient to my callings. My favorite thing. Bears it out. Bible bears this out in Romans 17 and Matthew chapter 5 and Beatitudes. Want to know one awesome benefit? Those who are about their father's business, the Bible says that they're what? They're heirs. They're going to inherit the entire earth one day. They're going to inherit the entire earth. So often we, we are so concerned and caught up with, like I said, the cares of this life. And it's easy to do. We have to work. We have to have jobs. We have to make provision for our families. And those are important things. But remember the story of Martha and Mary. Was it important to feed the people today? Yeah. They need, she, Jesus needed to be fed. The disciples needed to be fed. But what did Jesus say? Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen that good part and it won't be taken away from her. What was she doing? She was sitting at the feet. She was gleaning from the Lord. She was about the Father's business. There are things that are important and there are things that not. And usually it's the opposite of what we think. There are things that matter, truly. Think about, I want, I, I, it's so easy to throw this out and say this, but really try to grasp this this morning. In a hundred years from now, in a hundred years from now, 1900 wasn't that long ago. 1915 really wasn't that long ago. Does anything matter that day at, at, at Sunday on 12.29 p.m., is there anything that mattered that day that people were, were doing, naturally speaking? No. It's all been forgotten. What mattered was what they did to build their father's business, to build the kingdom of God. As I bring this to a close today, I want to read quickly from Revelations 3, 14, verses, 20, verses 14 through 22. It says, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of create, the creation of God. 
Whenever God begins to speak, you know what we need to do? We need to listen. We need to start, okay, God, you, you got my full and undivided attention. Here's what God says. I know your works. I know your works. I know what you've been doing to build my kingdom. Or maybe what you haven't been doing to build my kingdom. And you know what I know? I know that you are neither cold nor hot. Listen to this. This is incredible. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, this is incredible. I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. Lukewarmness causes God to vomit us out of his mouth. That should really cause us to stand up and take notice. Because you say I am rich. A lot of us, a lot of people in this world in Christian circles that are rich. They've done the... They, 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 they've made sure that they have the big church and they, they have churches of thousands of people and huge coliseums. They're rich. They've become wealthy. And guess what? They don't think they have need of anything. But they don't know something that he says, you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. But he doesn't just leave us there. He says, I counsel you. Here's the solution. To buy from me gold refined in a fire. What is fire? It's hot. It doesn't feel very comfortable. But when you do this, you're going to be rich in white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, guess what? Be zealous. Be zealous. The Bible says be zealous for good works and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, anyone, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come in, and I'm going to dine with him and he with me, and listen to this, to him who overcomes, not to him who sat complacently on their laurels and didn't do anything, to him who, over, those are the people that, that sit complacently, those are the ones that are lukewarm, those are the ones that he says, I'm going to, bleh, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth, I would rather have you be cold than be lukewarm. But to you who overcomes, to you who was about my business, who fulfilled the calling of God in your life, here's what's going to happen. I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Also, as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne, he who has an ear, guess what? Let him hear what I'm saying to the churches. It is lukewarmness and a focus on ourselves that causes us to be apathetic and complacent instead of being about our father's business. Jesus overcame because, guess what? He was about the Father's business, and he did the work of him who sent me. I want to ask you this morning, what drives you? What in life motivates you? What consumes you? I know for me, there are things in my life that it just, it's in, I, I say about my, my, a certain hobby of mine. It's not my passion, it's my obsession. It consumes me. But you know what I want to be consumed with? I want to be consumed as in, what happens when something is consumed? When a log on the fire is consumed, what happens? It, it, it's nothing. It, it ceases. Everything in that log is burned. That's what we want, should want for our lives spiritually, to be consumed, to be passionate about our Father's business. What are your goals in life? What are your goals in life? What is your life's purpose? I'm sure we can all just throw something random, but really think about that this week and meditate. What is the purpose of your life? We all have one. We aren't just wandering through aimlessly without a purpose in life. We all have a purpose. God has created. We didn't evolve. We were created with a purpose, a calling. Whether you're saved or you're unsaved, whether people know it or not, you do have a calling. There's something God has called you to do. You need to find out what it is. You need to believe on him who sent sent send him. You need to believe on Jesus as the son. You need to find out what that calling is. You need to begin to mature. What are the things that you are doing today that will matter in 100 years? In 2115, at 1230 on Sunday afternoon, what will you have done when you're six feet under the ground and you have ceased to exist naturally, eternally, what will you have done that will matter? Where will you be? 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on what is happening today, but on what is unseen. For what is seen 
is temporary, but what is unseen is, guess what? That's eternal. Some things are more important than others. Some have greater value than others. Some are eternal. Some things will, that we do today will matter in 100 years. Most of it will not. It's the part that will matter that we need to figure out. Our all-consuming desire should be to be about our Father's business and to build His kingdom in whatever way, whether it's standing up here and preaching, whether it's preaching to your neighbors, to your loved ones, to the lost, to believing on Him, whatever that calling is, whatever God has called you to do, whatever business He has called you to be a part of, we need to find out and do it. Because Matthew 6.33, guess what? I love this section of Scripture. says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first, not second, not after I've done my job at work, not after I've made sure everything at home is perfect, not after I've built my bank account, my retirement fund, not after I've enjoyed all of my hobbies. He says, no, 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 no. That stuff should go to the rear. Seek first my kingdom. Build my kingdom. And you know what's going to happen? One of the benefits, all these other things, all these other things you're so concerned about, those are going to be added. What's the Bible say? He loves to give good gifts to his children. I can't tell you how often in my life the little insignificant things that I know in 100 years are going to matter, all my hunting trophies, which aren't going to matter, the Lord still allowed me to be blessed by. He even blesses in the little things. But first, first and foremost, we need to seek his kingdom. We need to make an investment. Everybody nowadays is concerned with investing. You know what the biggest investment we can make is? In his kingdom. Building his kingdom because you know what? It's the only thing that's going to last because in Matthew 6, 19 and 21 it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on this earth because you know what happens to the treasures in this earth? You know what happens to all the retirement investment accounts? Those eventually fade away. Moth and rust can destroy those things. Your fancy cars are toys. I like toys, I'll be honest. I, I love toys. But you know what? They break. They get old. They go to the junkyard. Those things fade away. But, but, here's what doesn't fade away. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves cannot or do not break in and steal. For where, listen to this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Are you about the Father's business? Are you building his kingdom in your life and in the lives of those around you? Because you know what? That's what's going to matter in 100 years. Being about the Father's business. Jesus was faithful to the end. And thank God, because next week we celebrate Easter, his death, and guess what? His resurrection. Had he not been about his Father's business, we would be in a heap of trouble today. But if we want to be like him, if we want to become mature sons and daughters in the faith, we need to be about the Father's business. Amen?